Abby Stepik's friends and family described her as being happy and affectionate, but oftentimes sassy. She was creative, enjoyed photography, and always tried to make people laugh. Her mother, Lori Jernigan, said, quote, She was very funny. She would not let you leave a room without making you laugh. She loved people and animals and would do anything for her friends, often standing up for them if anyone was causing them trouble. She was athletic, a volleyball player, and liked to spend time on the beach. Though, living in the landlocked state of Arkansas, Abby only got to visit the ocean on occasion. Whenever she went, she would collect seashells and liked to give them away as gifts. As she got farther in high school, Abby set her sights on going to cosmetology school to become a makeup artist. She also toyed with the idea of being a realtor. Abby turned 18 in the spring of her junior year of high school in 2015. Though she was now an adult and trying to be more independent, she was still a student in high school and living at home. She'd gotten a job at the Foot Locker at the local McCain Mall the summer before her senior year. Her stepfather, Michael Jernigan, said that the new crowd she started hanging out with after starting her new job concerned him. He said, quote, That's the dangerous part of raising kids. She had new friends, new behaviors. You're sending her to the lion's den. Her mother, Lori, said that Abby became so different that she hardly recognized her. And the weeks before her disappearance, Abby's behavior changed noticeably. She decided to switch schools before her senior year, going from the private school she'd attended the past three years to Central High School in Little Rock. Her family didn't know her new friends very well, and her old friends were skeptical that this new crowd was good for Abby but she was quick to make friends and very trusting. Her parents especially did not like Ebby's most recent boyfriend, and he may have had an influence on her decision to swap schools. Among the changes her parents noticed was that Ebby would frequently lie to them about where she was going. She was abrasive, confrontational, and constantly starting fights. Her parents had told her that she needed to either stop lying to them and provoking fights or find somewhere else to stay. Prior to moving out, Abby would sometimes text her friend Danielle Westbrook in the middle of the night and ask to come over because she'd been arguing with her parents. Though she would give Abby somewhere to cool down after fighting with her parents, Danielle agreed that Abby's new friends were not good for her. She even tried to warn Abby, telling her that she did not trust them. Hi, I'm your host, Zach Williams. Welcome to Compulsion. On September 24th, Abby officially went to stay with her older brother Trevor, but would often spend the night at friends' houses with her grandparents or with her biological father, Peter Stepik. Around this time, Abby's school called her parents to inform them she had been missing class and was truant. Abby's parents didn't approach her about it. After all, she was an adult, and although she was still in school and making poor decisions, there wasn't much they could do. Even though Ebby had moved out and was in a rough patch with her parents, she would still call or text Lori and Michael every day. In the last week of October, Ebby stayed with Danielle and her guardian. She'd Snapchatted Danielle to ask if she could spend the night, and Danielle responded right away that she was welcome and dinner was almost ready. The two spent a lot of time together, hanging out or driving around town, and were very comfortable with each other. On October 21st, Ebby was going to pick up Danielle from a doctor's appointment before school, but the appointment ran late. Danielle texted Ebby to say, quote, Hey, if I'm going to make you too late to school, you can go on. Paula said you can feel free to eat anything and to make yourself at home. To this, Ebby responded, quote, No, it's not a big deal at all, I swear. I really didn't want to go today anyway, because there's all that drama. Ebby skipped class that day, but Danielle didn't pry about the drama. That night, they went to church, and while they were at youth group, Ebby asked Danielle to help her re-pierce her nose since it had healed over. Danielle later remarked, quote, We laughed about that for days. That was kind of the highlight of the week. Ebby had multiple piercings, as well as a tattoo on her ribcage that read, quote, Every night has a brighter day. On October 23rd, Ebby went to a house party, 
She invited Danielle, who declined because she really didn't know the crowd. At the party, Abby was sexually assaulted, and the assault was videotaped. Most initial media reports said that there were four men involved, but the family has confirmed that there was only one suspect, though there may have been others who knew or saw the videotape. The consensus seems to be that there was one boy who was a suspect in the actual rape, but three other boys were complicit or involved in the videotaping. Her stepfather later remarked that, quote, She went out that Friday night, and the things that happened changed her. It blindsided us. The next day, on October 24th, she texted Michael to say, quote, Something really bad happened last night. I don't want anyone saying I told you or anything. I just need help, please. She told him that there had been some kind of incident at a party and that she wanted to go to the police about it. Abby had called the police either before she texted Michael or early on the 24th while they were still discussing it and told him they were very unhelpful. He was going to go with her and try to make sure that they actually filed a report. Abby didn't tell Michael the full extent of what happened, so he and Lori were worried, but not overly worried. That same day, Abby made plans with Danielle to go to an ice cream social at church the next day and told her that she was going to reach out to Trevor soon and go back to his house since he was worried about her. Abby was leaning on her support network, and they were there for her. She made sure to communicate with everyone, and though she hadn't solidified her plans for when she and Michael would go to the police station, she was staying in contact with everyone. She spent much of that day napping and watching TV with her grandparents, Debbie and Richie. Abby and her grandparents were close, and they had a room set aside for her and her sister to sleep in when they came over. The room had the walls lined with pictures of Abby and their other grandchildren. After dinner that night, the trio went out for frozen yogurt, where Abby recognized one of the boys working at the shop. They got home around 8 p.m., and Abby told them she needed to go meet her stepfather. She hugged her grandmother Peggy, and they exchanged I love yous, with Peggy telling her to be careful. Her grandfather later recalled that Abby said, quote, I'll be back. Don't lock the door. I'll be back to spend the night. When Abby walked out the door, it was the last time she would see her grandparents. They were the last family members to see Ebby before she vanished, but police took over a year and a half to interview them about the incident. When Ebby didn't come home, they both tried to call her, but she did not pick up. Michael later remarked that he doesn't know why Ebby didn't meet him, but theorized that perhaps she went to try and get a copy of the recording of her assault at the party. They hadn't yet agreed on the exact time and place before Ebby stopped texting him back. Abby didn't want to meet at her grandparents, as she hadn't told them what had happened and didn't want to upset them. Michael was concerned, but still thought she would text him when she was ready to go over. A later look at her phone revealed that she called the Little Rock Police Department twice that night, each call lasting about a minute. Her mother thinks that these phone calls were her trying to report the rape over the phone. Little Rock Police told Lori they had no records of Ebby calling them and no notes from anyone who would have taken the call. They went so far as to deny the calls showing up in their call logs. Ebby didn't respond to or open any text messages sent after the night of the 24th. Monty Vickers, the private investigator who would eventually get involved in the case, said that Ebby had texted the young men she'd accused of being involved in her assault and threatened to go to the police unless they gave her the video but they told her it had been erased. Ebby didn't believe them. Ebby's last known contact before her disappearance was a phone call with her brother Trevor in the afternoon of October 25th of 2015. Michael was worried about Ebby, so Trevor called and she didn't pick up, but then called him right back. Though initial media reported the phone call as Ebby refusing to say where she was, Later articles said Ebby sounded panicked and confused and told him she was parked in her car in front of his driveway. He said he would be right out, then hung up as he was walking out, but when he went outside, she wasn't there. He called her back, and the two had a four-minute conversation of him asking her where she was and what's happening. She said she was in her car, but didn't know where she was parked or who she was with. Trevor said Ebby, quote, sounded like she was high on drugs, but specified that she didn't sound drunk. No slurring of the words. She couldn't tell him if she was with anyone else and said, quote, I'm fucked up. He tried to get any helpful information, but didn't seem to be getting anywhere. 
He ended the call to call Michael to see if he could track her through her phone at all, but Michael said they didn't have a way to. When Abby didn't show up for the social the next day, Danielle went without her. Abby had been excited about the party, but Danielle didn't initially think there was anything wrong when she didn't show up. Abby had a lot to deal with at the time. However, when Abby's sister texted Danielle while she was still at the social, asking if she'd seen Abby, Danielle knew there was something wrong. Ebby's sister told her about the phone call with Trevor, and Danielle started texting and calling Ebby to no avail. She later remarked, quote, When I didn't get a response, that was like my heart was already shattered, but it fell out of my chest. In the days that followed, Danielle drove to all the places she thought Ebby might be, her favorite spots around town, but found no sign of her. Ebby's family tried to report her missing immediately after the phone call but they were told they had to wait until she had been missing for at least 12 hours. While this is a common occurrence on crime shows, there is no actual law that states a person needs to wait a certain amount of time before reporting someone missing. They finally were able to declare Ebby missing on the 26th. They called right at the 12-hour mark. Lori and Michael both took off work to search for Ebby. The officer who initially came to their house and took the report told them that she was likely just to run away. The officer told Lori that Ebby being missing would be very hard, and he told her and Michael that it would put a strain on their marriage. He even went so far as to say it could destroy it. He gave them a report number, but when they went to check up on the report, the number did not have a case attached to it. LRPD gave them a few different phone numbers, but none of them were for a police officer who was working Ebby's case. Eventually, they found out the detective who'd been assigned to their case was off for a few days, so Lori and Michael went down to the station to speak with someone. The officers listened and asked questions. Detective Roy Williams stood out as being interested and gave them his phone number, but told them not to talk to the media about Ebby. On the 28th, three days after the phone call with her brother, a security guard at Chalamont Park reported that there was an abandoned Volkswagen Passat parked in a lot near the woods. He'd called multiple times on multiple days to get the police to come get the car, and had first spotted the car on the 26th. Eventually, a neighbor also complained because they were concerned that there must be something wrong if a car that had so many clothes and possessions clearly visible was left for days on end. Police showed up on the 30th to investigate the car. They found the keys still in the ignition, with the gas tank empty and the battery dead. Ebby had left her phone, wallet, and contacts in the front seat. The police contacted Peter when they found the car, as his name was also on the title. They just called to tell him he needed to get his car out of the park. Peter had to tell them that the car belonged to his daughter, Ebby. LRPD had told Lori that they'd put out an APB and a BOLO alert on her and her car but apparently they had not actually done so. Little Rock PD left the trunk of Ebby's car open after they processed it, causing serious water damage to all of her belongings when a rainstorm swept through. Lori later said, quote, It ruined everything that was left of her car, any of the things that were hers that we could have kept. When her parents got the car back, Michael photographed the state of everything. Then they washed and folded all of her clothes that were salvageable, and put them in the spare room, hoping to give them to her when she came back. Lori said that so many of her possessions being in the car should have told the police that she was not a runaway. She also said that Little Rock police had told her they searched the park with a bloodhound, but later she said she didn't believe they had actually done so. Abby's car was found less than a mile from her friend Brittany's house. This may or may not be relevant, but the media reached out to Brittany to talk about their friendship. Brittany said Ebby was her first real friend, and the two used to make frequent trips to nearby Chalamont Pool during the summers. Brittany said, quote, No matter if you were having a bad day or if you were sad, she could make you laugh. She always was able to make people feel good about themselves. On November 3, 2015, one of Ebby's friends, Kaylee Foley, and her mother Margie went to Chalamont Park to search for clues about Ebby's disappearance. They noticed the smell of decomposition was coming from a storm drain near the spot where Ebby's car was found. Margie called 911 and spoke with a Pulaski County dispatcher to tell them about the possible lead. 
She later said she had to call three times before she could get someone on the line. The dispatcher called LRPD about five minutes after they ended the call with Foley, and LRPD asked the dispatcher if they'd sent anyone out. But they said they hadn't, because it was LRPD's jurisdiction. Foley waited about an hour for the police to show up. When they did, they spent a few minutes shining flashlights into the drain, then told Foley that she was just smelling sewage. Foley later said, quote, they brushed me off. It's important to note that storm drains are not the same as sewers. They simply carry rainwater, so there was no reason for police to think that there would be sewage in that pipe. Margie left a few phone messages for the lead investigator as well, just to make sure the tip reached him, and later remarked, quote, They kept dismissing me. It never set right with me. In the weeks after Ebby first vanished, friends texted her asking her at first to see if she was in fact missing then later expressing their worry and how much they missed her. Her parents said she received hundreds of texts. The last message Danielle sent her said, quote, Ebby, just come home already. This freaking sucks, and we're all hurting. So much fear and worry, and I just want to know you're okay. Danielle would often speak to the media whenever they wanted to write about Ebby, and she was always eager to reminisce about their friendship. She said Ebby could have a bit of a shell and came off as tough, but when you got to know her, she let her guard down. She told the Arkansas Democrat Gazette that, quote, To me, that was one of the most important things, was that I actually got to know her on a deep level. I actually got to know her, and not just the outline of her. She said Abby was fierce and would stand up for her friends if they were being bullied. Danielle said that she recorded all of the footage of the news covering Abby's story and would watch it on repeat in the early days of her disappearance. Meanwhile, police initially refused to check which tower Ebby's phone had pinged on before she vanished, because they said they didn't have the resources. Eventually, a few weeks in, law enforcement did check out the ping data from her cell phone. However, law enforcement put in a request for the wrong phone number. This initially led them to tell her family her phone's data from that day was in a remote area about 45 minutes away. LRPD took them to where the phone had pinged, but didn't want to search the area. Lori and Michael decided to search the area themselves, spending hours combing through brush and fields. LRPD realized their error quickly, then pinged the right number, but didn't tell Lori and Michael right away. It was actually two days later that they told them they had the wrong ping. Her cell phone had pinged off the closest tower to Chalamont Park, so she'd been there already when she called Trevor. After the first 30 days, the lead detective on the case told Michael and Lori that they thought Ebby would have come home by now, and since she hadn't, she was either out of state or dead. In mid-January of 2015, the reward for information about Ebby was increased to $15,000, and her case saw a bit of coverage in the news. But Lori and Michael were still trying to follow the police's advice about not speaking with the media. They had Monty Vickers working for them fairly early on, though. He was a retired Little Rock police detective himself, and despite the missteps, he and Ebby's family were still cautiously optimistic that the investigation might turn around. Vickers had the names of the four men that Ebby had accused and started looking into them. He searched the woods near all of their houses for her body. The police had spoken with the four men accused of being involved in sexually assaulting Ebby, but law enforcement did not try to obtain their phones or make any attempt to look for the alleged video. The police captain, Mike Davis, later told Lori that there was no probable cause to get the boys' phones. When she asked him what evidence he would need to determine probable cause, Davis said that he alone decided what counted as probable cause. Vickers also spent hours talking to all of Ebby's friends and acquaintances and recorded all of his interviews. Ebby's parents still keep all of the recorded interviews with her friends in a closet in their house. When Vickers spoke with Danielle, she told him that authorities had never reached out or tried to interview her. She said, quote, I was just waiting for someone to knock on the door, and no one ever did, and that really made me feel like the police weren't doing anything. During the early days of the search, Lori started to consider that Ebby had been either kidnapped or otherwise persuaded into sex trafficking. She checked Backpage and Craigslist, and followed up on leads on Facebook from people who thought they may have spotted Ebby online. 
One message was from a woman who told Lori they thought they'd found an email trying to negotiate a price to buy Ebby on their boyfriend's computer. Lori said, quote, I mean that alone, seeing an email from someone saying they're buying her for $25,000 and calling her names, it was awful, awful, awful. The email actually turned out to be a scam. Michael said they'd had four or five incidents where people claimed they knew who had Ebby and were asking for money to get more information or get her back. Meanwhile, the Find Ebby Stepic Facebook page was growing in popularity, and that brought with it a certain degree of unpleasantness. Lori was contacted by a Facebook account claiming to be Ebby who told her, quote, Hi mom, I'm okay, but I'm not going to come home. Commenters would post that they thought Ebby was dead, and remark on how they found Lori and Michael suspicious. Lori followed up on the bulk of any useful leads with the help of Vickers. The false leads and speculation didn't bother her, though. Lori was just happy that Ebby's case was getting more attention. Due to Lori's concerns about trafficking, Halo's Investigations joined in, which is a private firm that searches for missing or trafficked children. They searched Chalamont Park with the assistance of LRPD and would help Vickers in searching Backpage or Craigslist for girls who matched Ebby's description. Tina Stores, a case manager at Halos, said that she didn't think Ebby was a runaway because they normally came home in a matter of days or weeks. Several months into the investigation, Vickers was starting to lose faith in his old department. Law enforcement would not speak to him or return his calls. He started to be a bit more proactive in his own search. Vickers contacted the security guard from Chalamont Park, who said law enforcement never spoke to him after he made the report. LRPD had told her parents three separate times that they'd interviewed the security guard, but apparently this wasn't true. The security guard told Vickers that at one point he'd had footage of Ebby meeting a man in that same park at multiple different times before she disappeared, but he'd since lost the footage as his computer had been replaced since then. It was April of 2016 when Michael found out LRPD had lied about interviewing the security guard and as a result had lost potentially valuable footage. That's when he told Vickers to start reaching out to people that law enforcement claimed they had already interviewed. Up until that point, they'd been afraid of interfering with the investigation, but it was becoming clear that law enforcement was not going to find Ebby. This was when tensions started to really escalate between the family and law enforcement. Many of the incidents described by Lori about the harassment committed by LRPD were documented in her interview with the podcast The Vanished. She also went on Nancy Grace and Dr. Phil. These interviews were the only sources that would call out the officers involved by name. Local papers did not report on the more concerning acts committed by law enforcement during the duration of the case. The Vanished, in particular, stands out as being the most comprehensive interview Lori has done. But, as it's an audio medium, many of the downright illegal acts committed by LRPD are not documented in any print sources and don't really show up in any mainstream news sources. One of the first concerns for Lori and Michael was getting access to Ebby's phone records. LRPD didn't have an IT department, so Lori offered to find and pay for an IT professional to assist. Sergeant J.C. White, who was largely in charge of the case, said that he didn't want any outside help coming in. However, they eventually caved and took Lori up on her offer. They let the IT consultant she'd picked out start going through Ebby's accounts, but quickly changed their minds when he changed one of Ebby's passwords to get into an account. They accused Lori of compromising the investigation and threatened to throw her in jail. Before police took him off of the case, however, the IT consultant said he'd found some concerning activity on Ebby's accounts and said it was possible that LRPD was changing and possibly deleting information on her Google account. Eventually, police got a hold of Ebby's phone records, but they didn't realize the records they obtained were showing a different time zone. Law enforcement noticed that the statements the family gave about Ebby's whereabouts and phone contact with them did not match up at all with the times on the phone records and accused them of lying. The police then accused Michael of being a suspect. Lori said in her interview with The Vanished, that, quote, they wanted this to be a scenario of a stepdad doing something with his daughter. They questioned Michael for over three hours, accusing him of killing Ebby. They interviewed Lori for over two hours, saying they needed recorded statements, but didn't record anything or take notes. 
Michael had the foresight to record his interview, though. Police had obviously figured out how to pull phone records at this time, and even though they pulled the family's phone records, they still made no attempt to pull the phone records of the four boys accused of being involved in Ebby's assault. The single interview they'd done with each boy three weeks after Ebby vanished remained the only time they had ever brought them in for questioning. Music is provided by Hex System. Major sources for this episode include The Vanished and the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. This episode is sponsored by Harvard Wisdom, a new publication by Sunha Paul Kim, sharing the collective wisdom of over 170 Harvard graduates. For a full list of sources, as well as links to our contributors and sponsors, please see our show notes. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram for our latest episodes and news. See you in two weeks.